So John Jumper is a scientist, a uh, computer scientist by training at, at DeepMind Incorporated, um, which is a spin out from Google. And he will talk about highly accurate protein structure prediction with AlphaFold. So we have John on the stage. Thank you, John. Thank you so much, Kat. Oh, one small uh, thing. I am a trained biophysicist, by the way. I did my PhD with Tobin Sosnick and Carl Fried. Um, I've, I've actually not taken a computer science course. I should eventually get to that. But um, so, uh, yeah, I, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, I'll try to tell you something new about AlphaFold. And let me go ahead and start the presentation. And so... And I first want to say, by way of introduction, I really enjoyed Helen's talk, and and just as a as a um, to say kind words about the PDB, it's one of the most incredible, or maybe the most incredible, resource in biology, and uh, and it's been absolutely enabling for this project. But it's also from a machine learning perspective, you know, we hear a lot about machine learning that enables us to do what humans might do but faster, easier, just incredibly that a machine can do it, like identify uh, images of cats. But it's, it's, it's really unbelievable and humbling that we have this resource that enables us to do machine learning, which, you know, when it goes well, right, the machine learning system is able to produce months to years of incredible work by very, very talented researchers uh, for a single structure. And that's enabled by having this incredible collection and incredibly well curated and open collection that the PDB has put together. And so it's just uh, really great uh, to be able to give this talk to such an audience. And I mean, the other, the other kind of really important aspect has been, you know, the story kind of started in the public at CASP, right? And CASP itself has been an incredible um, kind of essential for showing in computational methods what works. Uh, what really, really works. And I think it's incredible to see the articles from just before CASP started from the early 90s, talking about how protein folding was, or protein structure prediction was probably solved back then. And it was only really the cold light of really blind prediction and enabled by experimentalists uh, allowing their structures to be used there that really showed how far we had to go back then. Um, and we say we, because I was, I, that's a little bit generous because I was quite young at the, that point. Um, and I think that uh, that really it's been a great kind of collaboration point for experimentalists and computationalists to talk about their work. And so, of course, AlphaFold, as you've no doubt heard, uh, did very, very well on this kind of we, we look at RMSD at 95 percent coverage is one way to look at it. And that's sub angstrom for AlphaFold on very challenging proteins in CASP and around a third of what other methods available at the time could do. And this represented a really, really large progress. And I'll tell you a bit both about um, how we thought about it and how we did that and also uh, where it's been going since CAS. And obviously one big part of that is we've released openly available code that a lot of people have used and uh, notebooks and really easy ways to get these structure predictions, but also uh, in collaboration with Imbol, who has been absolutely amazing, we've released the database of 21 model organisms and we have a plan to expand that to about, from 350,000 predictions there to about 100 million predictions um, covering roughly UNIREF 90 or something like that. So we think that this is going to be an incredible moment in which a structure will go from something um, that is quite rare, quite spotty for downstream analysis or really like proteome scale analysis to something that's extremely regular. And I think it'll lead to an exciting era of bioinformatics. Now, to say kind of how AlphaFold works or to start to say, or like, what's different about AlphaFold? And really, from the beginning, we worked to build the kind of what we understood, what biophysicists had understood about proteins and had understood for a while. Like, how do we think about the geometry or what's been learned about evolution and coevolution, all these things? How do we not build that around the system, but put that into the neural network system? And instead of kind of taking components off the shelf, we really said, well, what if we sit down in an interdisciplinary way and take very seriously that we want to build the ML pieces that we need to understand proteins? And these kind of became specific points, like, you know, we de-emphasize the sequence in favor of the space and, and other kind of very, very technical points, but the core 
has really been that probably what was missing was not even, you know, you always hear about machine learning and it's so and needs so much data. Well, the data sat there, the PDB was ready. And I think the PDB was ready for a while, but what was really missing was partially the compute, but mainly an understanding of how we build systems that build this knowledge into the network that really make them uh, want to learn the uh, protein structures in an efficient way. And this goes back to a long running kind of um, perspective that's been developing in the, or has developed in the ML community under the term of inductive bias. That when you build these complicated, nonlinear, really, really interesting systems, um, it matters, the details matter, how things communicate matter, and it matters what kind of things they say want to learn. So some of the early ones that were used in images were convolutional networks that always worked on these local patches and would build up pieces and pieces of local patches. And that was driven by an understanding of the vision system and also driven by an understanding of, oh, well, I want to pick out an eye and I want to pick out another eye and then I want to start picking out maybe a face and then something else. And so it was from that kind of compositional perspective that these things came about. Similarly, there were what called recurrent networks, which kind of said, well, if I want to produce something and then I want to produce the next thing, et cetera, et cetera, kind of like an HMM. And so these perspectives, and there have been others, graph networks, attention, all that kind of express different ways to think about the problem, and none are quite exactly aligned with how we want to think about protein structure or interaction or protein physics. For, and this, if you want an analogy that's maybe more biophysical, it's much like force field development for... Um, molecular dynamics simulations, where it really, really matters how aligned the kind of terms you build are to the underlying physics. Here, this is more general sense, but how well is the information flow aligned? And the kind of component that we took was a, we started, maybe started from these attention networks, something in which the machine is able to build its own connections as you go through the network but then heavily modified and changed and try and build the right version to understand the kind of data we see. And the other perspective we started from, and this has been kind of a longstanding perspective in the field, is this is my very coarse causal diagram of, uh, of protein data, right? That the sequence causes the structure, Anfinson's dogma, um, via physics, via you know solution structure. It doesn't carry around a list of its ancestors. But then the structure, more specifically the conservation of structure over evolution, tends to cause the evolutionary history to reflect the structure. And then evolutionary structure uh, prediction, uh, these are the co-evolution methods that have become very successful. You can think of as non-causal, as not causal machine learning, but rather Bayesian. What is the structure that explains this pile of sequence data and enabled by the genomics revolution enabled us to get these enormous sequence databases, right? So sequence data is growing something like 3,000 times faster than structured data if you look at the relative growth of the PDB and uh, something like Trimble. And so you re we really want to leverage this large amount of data, and we really want to leverage all these things. We want to leverage the sequence, what we know about physics, what we know about evolution, and we want to put them together. And this is really expressed quite directly in how AlphaFold is built, where we take a multi-sequence alignment built with standard tools, built with Jackhammer and HH Blitz, and using uh, standard databases and metagenomic databases. Um, we also build something that's more aligned to the physics. Physics is pairwise and local, so we build a residue pair type structure um, really out of the sequence, and then if there are any templates, we put that in too. And we pass this though through a system, and I won't talk very much about the details of these blocks, but that kind of evolves the network's understanding of both the multi-sequence alignment and the pairs of residues. And at the very end, what we've got is we've now got kind of evolved information and how that evolves will be set later. But um, after we've built these kind of new pictures of the MSA and a new picture of the pair, then we put this into what's called the structure module. And this is something that builds in geometry, that builds 3D coordinates out of these uh, different features that we have made. And so this whole process, one important point about this process is that we can now make it end-to-end, -end, that we have a place where we've stuck in the evolution, 
we've thought about the sequence, we've thought about the pairs and locality and all those things that we know we need to think about. Residues are the level at which we're thinking about the protein. All these things are kind of mashed together and communicate in this block that we designed, this EVO former. All of these things kind of mix, and at the end, we do geometry and we build structure. And the important point is, when you start this neural network, it will build the wrong structure. It will build a horrible, terrible thing. Uh, but the entire process uh, can be improved. And so you do a very simple thing where you measure the error between the structure and the true structure, and you change your parameters slightly. And um, there's an enormous amount of technical detail. One of the more interesting ones is also uh, what we call recycling, that in fact, the neural network can be even better if you keep feeding its uh, outputs back into its inputs, and that can make it behave like a much deeper neural network. Because one of the real surprises coming from, you know, I came from a simulation community, um, is that we're predicting protein structure with a finite number of fixed computation layers. We're not doing kind of an optimization here or anything else exactly. We are doing each block, say if you count the recyclings, we do 192 blocks of computation and produce this structure. Um, in addition, we kind of, we produce the network's own belief of its error. Right, and this is also very direct and enabled by our ability to um, pass information backwards to improve the parameters that when we produce a prediction, we also score it. We say how good it is automatically during the neural network process, but then we also ask the network how, how right or wrong was each residue or each residue pair. And we train those as well. And so what we end up with is a neural network that produces both its answers and where it thinks its answers are wrong. And that works really, really well. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And so um, where I think you should really look, by the way, if you're, if you're looking at this, and AlphaFold is a big system and a complex system, uh, even for ML practitioners. But if you want to see really where the work happens is within this EVO former block. And exactly how you pass that information is much, much better aligned to understanding proteins and building in our protein understanding than what had come before. And uh, you can see all the details in our papers, but it's a little bit specialist, I should say. But there is a, another point in perspective I want to take on this problem is that there was, you know, which parts of this mattered? And, you know, some people have focused on different parts or spent their time thinking about networks that really understand geometry, equivariant networks, all these other things. And our experience in AlphaFold has been that all the parts mattered. And what you can see in this chart is that uh, each row of this chart is if you remove this one specific kind of innovation that we put into AlphaFold, how much worse is it for the left is on CASP and on the right is for a set of basically all PDB uh, chains in the last two years. And you can see differences and some things are more important than others, but each of those differences are quite small and quite a bit smaller than the difference between AlphaFold and competing methods. So um, in the kind of language of cellular biology, the single knockouts are boring. Some of the double knockouts start to become interesting. You can see that at the bottom where we remove a certain geometric component and make the network much shallower. But in general, um, what we found is that it was very important and kind of additive that you build in many, many places our understanding and intuitions about proteins into the design of this system. Now we, we had kind of intuitions and guesses and measurements as we built AlphaFold, but then after we built it, we, we needed to go back and check and see if those were really reflected in the system. And we started to see some really interesting things, and this is kind of opening the black box after the fact. And one, one important point to think about, and when you think about what does AlphaFold do, what problem does AlphaFold actually solve, is it, it solves what I think of as the PDB phone call, that uh, that your uh, skilled structural biologist friend calls you up excitedly and says they just deposited a structure in PDB. And let me tell you the sequence of one of those chains is this. Now, what structure do you think I deposited or what coordinates? And so, and because that's how it was trained, right? We pulled examples from PDB. We pull a set of uh, one chain out of that. We pass it through AlphaFold. And that's in some ways, and as Guy says, an underspecified problem for many reasons. One is a purely dynamical one, that in, a, in the solution state, for example, you may have two cases, or uh, you have, may have multiple confirmations that interconvert spontaneously. More commonly, 
they interconvert due to um, differences in conditions like ligands, um, binding of nucleic acids, all sorts of things. And so this is an underspecified problem and AlphaFold has to give one of those answers. And it has to kind of guess because for example, this may be a heme binding protein. And we didn't tell AlphaFold that it was a heme binding protein or that there was a heme present. And yet what we will find is that at the end, AlphaFold will leave say a heme shaped hole in the middle and possibly some coordinating side chains for a heme that we didn't tell it about. And so AlphaFold really isn't producing APO structures it's producing its best guess for the coordinates that would appear in PDB, which in many cases are holo, if it can infer this. And this shows up somewhat spectacularly also in the case of homomeric structure or obligate trimers that have extremely interleaved shapes. In many cases, AlphaFold will actually do that correctly. Similarly, uh, it will position side chains exactly right for ion binding sites. Also interestingly, AlphaFold is really no worse at membrane proteins or novel folds even. So it's neither, it's not doing exactly fold recognition. It's perfectly fine with novel folds. It doesn't have an issue with that. It's fine with things that appear rarely because they all kind of come from the same both physical and evolutionary rules with slight tweaks. And so this has not uh, been an issue. But more interestingly if, is if we go into them, this is the EvoFormer block. Um, but if we go in the middle of that and say, what does AlphaFold know in each of the 192 steps of the calculation? And so here we trained uh, the little structure module to produce a different answer for each of these 192 steps without changing any other part of the network. And you can start to see how the movie on the right is a synthetic movie once per layer. And you can see the layer number in the bottom right. And you can see for a structure on the left, that's orphate. In this case, it's a very hard protein for alpha fold. And you can see kind of an iterative search. And even though the network itself is very abstract, that it implements a pretty concrete search for the correct structure. If you look at a uh, very large protein 2000 residue RNA polymerase, um, you can see that at the very beginning of the network, AlphaFold has little idea, but as you get through the network, you get strong iterative refinement. And so you can look at this also in graphs of the accuracy in GDT on a 100 point scale. And for some proteins like 1024, a, um, a protein that had strong templates, the accuracy jumps up very rapidly, and the model is nearly perfect after, say, 30 layers um, or 30 blocks. And if you look at harder proteins, you see something like computation time. The T264, the green line, is uh, Orfe is a very challenging protein, and here probably AlphaFold wasn't deep enough. And so this is the role of the, the recycling trick, is to give you enough computation to solve these problems but it's also interesting because it points to this very concrete notion in the middle of AlphaFold of which structure it's working on. And so the other part of the story, and I should tell this kind of quickly, is AlphaFold beyond single chains. And a lot of this story has happened very recently and will involve pictures of Twitter conversations. And, uh, and so here, one really interesting point, one thing that was very scary as we start to run AlphaFold over the human proteome and everything else is that uh, unlike on PDB structures, AlphaFold gave a lot of extremely low model confidence. Um, and you can see this in the kind of red spaghetti. And what that turned out to be is, in fact, intrinsically disordered regions. And some analysis uh, by uh, Blint Maz uh, Mazaros and Norman Davy and others have shown that AlphaFold is actually a very, very competitive and maybe state-of-the-art predictor of protein disorder just when it is low confident, low confidence. The other kind of really interesting story has been hacking AlphaFold, and this, this really started in a pair of tweets and some earlier work in the RosettaFold paper that said, well, if you train these systems to predict single protein structures, but provide them fake inputs, the easiest being put a flexible linker between two domains, um, another version being kind of insert a big gap, a fake gap into the sequence, that AlphaFold actually can predict complexes in many cases, and especially um, homomeric complexes. And maybe is state of the art uh, doing that according to some analysis by Brian et al. And so really that points to maybe um, both, it's an interesting fact, but it also points to kind of a generalized understanding of proteins or interactions or geometry <coughs> that's present in AlphaFold and is reflected in the same kind of physics cause complexes to interact as cause single chain structure. Um, some very recent work we've had, so I think this came out two days ago, um, is also though, if you go back and you do the right thing and, um, 
And so we trained AlphaFold and we adapt the inputs to be complexes. We adapt the, how, the loss function, how you measure error to handle symmetries and other issues and train AlphaFold on all the complexes in the PDB. Then um, this is what we call AlphaFold Multimer. And you can see on the left, that's actually quite a bit better even than the AlphaFold Linker. And you can see a very strong um, standard docking program, Plus Pro, also on there. And so, and you can see cherry picked examples on the right, but we think that AlphaFold uh, Multimer will have quite a bit to say and is quite a bit better at predicting these interactions. And we're really excited to see where that will go. And we um, are releasing that open source code shortly as soon as we uh, finish the engineering. And what we see there is a interestingly small improvement on homomer accuracy, you can see on the left, but a quite large improvement in heteromer accuracy. And as well, we have um, a confidence measure that we now call, that's called interface PTM, um, that is a quite good predictor of when, when AlphaFold is confident in these interactions. And I should mention that this has, or AlphaFold multiple, this has more limitations. It requires known, known stoichiometry. We don't yet do antibody uh, antigen complex as well. And unlike AlphaFold, where low confidence is actually a pretty strong sign of disorder, uh, low confidence of AlphaFold multimer is not yet a sign that your proteins don't interact. But we think that there's a lot of interesting work and then there's a lot of external work on AlphaFold and complexes and the, the recent structures from the Baker lab uh, using RosettaFold and AlphaFold to build um, eukaryotic complexes. And we think that there's a, going to be a lot of really explosive growth in our understanding of complexes on top of basically the same technology. And it's really, really exciting to see where that will go. So I'll uh, finally end with uh, enormous, you know, acknowledgements of the teams at um, DeepMind and Imbol that really brought this together and can't say enough good things about uh, Imbol and Smear and others and Gerhard, many, many others there and Edith, um, on making this happen and making the database happen. And there was really, really um, an exciting kind of moment for us when that database was available and everyone was kind of playing with this. And that's that's still really exciting. And we're really, really um, excited to see what, where this will go. And uh, with that, thank you for your time. And very, very much thank you for all the work that has gone into the PDB and what an incredible resource it is. Thank you. Thank you, John, that was great. And uh, I should have recognized your role, uh, your biophysical expertise and the way that you give your talks and the understanding you have, I apologize. Um, so no, no. actually, so there's some questions in the chat here. And one thing comes up a few times is, um, can these tools be used to predict which proteins uh, might exist as multiple states? Or another, is it possible to get an ensemble of predicted structures instead of a single structure? And kind of related to that is, if you take an example where you know there's two different structures in the PDB, let's say bound to a ligand and not, does AlphaFold give both of them or just give one or the other? So what we've seen, and we actually really, really uh, encountered this during CASP, um, when there were, you know, CASP is a very exciting time when you're not sure what you're doing. And what we, uh, what we have seen is in some cases, um, AlphaFold will have evidence of multiple structures. You really have to know where to look for it. Um, we provide five models, but often they will not pick up the diversity because each one was trained individually to produce what it thinks is the most likely state deposited in PDB. So it's somewhat rare that you get real diversity out of that. We do sometimes see evidence in model uncertainty that it will, that if you look at the di these auxiliary distance predictions or other things, it will be uncertain about pairs in which um, in which that reflects like a hinge motion in the in the T1024, the LMRP transporter. But in general, I would say we lack um, one of the one of the areas that we uh, want to improve is we lack state control. We lack the ability to specify Ipo, Holo, or any of these other kind of things. You will get more or less a state at random and sometimes chimeric states, which are not good. Um, I think it's an. I think it will. Uh, it's a. It's a research topic to to lift that kind of restriction, but I don't think it's an incredibly difficult one to lift in at least many cases. There are much harder questions on. Okay, well, what's the most stable confirmation under these conditions? That's a real physical delta delta G problem that I think will be substantially harder. But I think producing diverse examples. I mean, for example, uh, Roland Dunbrack did a great. 
analysis of what alpha fold produces for kinases, and it's kind of a reasonable overall distribution, but there's no reason that a model like alpha fold couldn't learn to produce both DFG in and DFG out for all the kinases, right? There are many, many examples to learn from. So I think I think we will see progress um, in, at that on some time frame. Yeah, and a second point, you know, you brought up um, hacking, and 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 or, or being able to use it to to, to predict complexes or or, or or disorder to order peptide binding, and you know, one one point that we should acknowledge is that DeepMind and your group made this technology available not only in terms of predictions, not only in terms of predicting whole genomes of many key organisms, but also making the code available for people to explore that and hack. So that's kind of cool because the community is sort of contributing to the thinking. Um, one, one question that comes up multiple times is, can you do this without templates? Can you do this on an engineered protein for which no uh, structure you know, is known? Uh, it's an obvious question, but I think it's very important to make that point clear about um, you made the point, but can you say again um, the, the scope of, of targets that you're able to deal with? Absolutely. Um, so one, you can see no templates, not using explicit, and we should be a little cautious on a deep learning system what templates mean, but in terms of providing templates as inputs, um, you can see that line in the uh, presentations, the third line down, and you can see it's worth absolutely nothing on CAS14 domains, and it's worth a small, small amount um, in general on PDB chain. So we see almost no benefit from templates. And we also see a very small difference between something that has no homologs in PDB and something that does. That there, you can measure it and you can see it in CAS, but it's a very small difference. And um, even out to novel folds. And I think that's really the key point is not just, can you do this? You know, it's not even a remote template recognition system it will go out to really, really novel folds at basically the same relationship. The important input is alignments. And so we need about 30 sequence alignments in order to deliver a high quality prediction. But that doesn't seem to be kind of where you might expect the limitations of alpha fold to be or where you might kind of transfer your understanding from really great template systems like Swiss model to alpha fold don't really apply. And at the same time, and we have seen interesting cases and there's some I think Tristan's found and others or Randy Reed, and where there is a template, a near one, a, you know, a 90% template, and AlphaFold will deviate from it. Um, and in some cases, that's because the template actually, in some cases, will it agree with the electron density better than the template. Um, so quite a, a surprising number of modeling errors have been found that way. And some of the CASP assessments have been really, really interesting, where it's getting, you know, I think I didn't really, I, I hadn't appreciated at the beginning of CASP, you know, uh, 90 GDT is, you know, John Malt called it competitive with experiment or hard to tell whether the errors were really the computational errors. And I wasn't so sure, but the really great analysis that CASP has done has really been about how much of that, like a lot of our disagreements with PDB structures happen at crystal contact locations and some of the other things. And that's been really, really surprising and interesting and certainly not all of them. And sometimes we give terrible answers, but it really is getting to this kind of interesting point where there's all sorts of interesting points of conversation as well as Guy, your work on NMR structures. So I think there's a tremendous amount to learn by learning from the results of alpha fold and comparing them, as you just said. Actually, I have about 30 questions here and you, I think you'll have the opportunity to respond to these uh, offline and that's what we'll do. So we're gonna move on to the next, the next presentation. Thank you so much, John. That's a, a great breakthrough.